morning and welcome to High Point Online. I'm Jenny. And I'm Gerald. And a special thank you to anyone who is new. This may be your first or second time. Today is a special Sunday because we are online only. On the last Sunday of the month, then we like to come together online, worship as one big High Point family. So what we would love for you guys to do is to drop a hi, a hello, tell us how you're doing in the comments so that we can make sure to say hi back. Sounds like a plan. So... Hi. Um, also with that, I want to tell you, highlight two things that are going on that's very important for you to know that is going to be outstanding for you to participate in as a family. So number one, in June, four Wednesdays in June, we have our summer, night, summer nights for our High Point kids. So guys, make sure you text HP Info to 97000, find out all the information so you guys can come out. And parents, here's a great thing. Your kids don't have school, but you can send them on the summer nights and you can get a couple of hours to yourselves. Woohoo! All right, so take time for that. What else we got going on? Yeah, my kids are super excited. Last year it was an amazing, amazing time. So if your kids are rising first through rising fifth, this is where you want them to be. It's it's super fun. It's perfect. So the other announcement we have is next week, June 5th, then we have our family meeting. Anyone who considers themselves a part of the High Point family, we invite you to come. Pastor Andy's going to talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Yes, and listen, so. here's the thing. Even if you don't consider yourself part of a High Point family, the fact that you're here, you are part of the High Point family. Mm -hmm. So just come out, see what, see the vision of the church, the heart of the church, yeah. what we have done and what we plan to do. So come regardless. Right. It's, it'll be right after service and we are providing lunch. Oh, so okay. come, eat some lunch and sit back and listen. I'm just kind of curious bit. what the lunch is. <laughs> yeah. anyway. uh, you'll have to come to find out. All right. That's <laughs> awesome. So as always, and for everyone that's new, you can find out everything that we're doing at High Point by texting HP Info to 97000. You know what else you can find out how to do on HP Info to 97000? We're going to transition into our time of giving. All right. We're, we're talking about the High Point family and, and find out what's going on. Another great thing is you could be able to see all your donations. What, what are we doing with what, 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 with what you give? Mm -hmm. Right. Where, your, where is your money going? Like, how are we serving the community? How are we building the kingdom and advancing it going towards for things that we, uh, a great purpose of, of God? So please, if you want to give, we're, we're called to give generously, mm -hmm. right? So we thank you for your generosity. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord God, for just being an awesome God, for being a faithful God. And we thank you for that which you have blessed us with. We pray, Lord God, that you uh, bless every person that gives today. Bless every person that has been giving to the to, to, this, to this ministry, Lord God, and we thank you for the fruit of their giving. We thank you, Lord God, that we're able to serve you, to serve our community, serve our state, and just let your, your, your abundance overflow for the things that we can do through their giving. Bless their hearts, in Jesus' precious and mighty name, amen. And now we're going to continue our service with a worship song, uh, and then Pastor Andy will finish out our Brave series. Amen. Lord, we praise you in this place, God. You are always with us, Lord. You are faithful in every season, God, and you have never left our side. Oh, we worship you, God. You know me by name. You called me. You called me. For all of my days.
Good morning and welcome to High Point Church Online. My name is Andy. I am the lead pastor here at High Point, and it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, If this is your first time here, we just want to say one more time, welcome. Uh, It's a thrill to be worshiping with you online, and uh, it's great to be here with you. Here's what I want you to do. Go ahead uh, and turn to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to jump straight into the text this morning. We're in a series called Brave. And let's be honest, if you're looking around right now, there's hardly an environment, place, situation where people can't use a little bit more courage or a little bit more bravery, right? Whether it's your personal life. I think most of us would agree, man, there are decisions that we have to make that just require a bit of courage and bravery, whether it's personal, whether we, you're watching the news and you're wondering how on earth have we not made political decisions that would be helpful here or, or this situation or this or that, or we're wondering how is this just not the job not getting done? We desire to see people, our leaders exhibit a bit more courage or bravery. Over the past several weeks, we've interviewed people. You can watch uh, the sermons uh, online. You can look at our, watch the YouTube uh, videos, YouTube channel. And we've been interviewing people about bravery in home, right? Bravery in your marriage, bravery in your personal life, having bravery in your parenting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that we live in an environment where it's easy to be passive, it's easy to ignore what needs to get done, and what we need is to grow and become more brave. Thus the series that we are in, and where we find ourselves ourselves in the book of Daniel. And today I want to speak to you very specifically about how to live bravely in your relationship with God. And even though I use the word specific, that sounds very vague, right? But there are going to be some very specific things that I want to call you to that I believe will apply in every aspect and area of your life. God has called you to be brave. Turn to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Here we go. King Nebuchadnezzar, right? He's the king of Babylon, In this moment, he made an image of gold 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. 
So we've got King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, right? He's made this image of gold, this statue of gold. It's big, it's gigantic. And just for reference sake, you can Wikipedia, King Nebuchadnezzar II. This guy is famous even outside of the Bible. He's referenced uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. That's attributed to King Nebuchadnezzar. And I make this point to you, wherever you're watching and streaming this sermon from, it's helpful to see the the characters of the Bible referenced outside the Bible because it gives credence a little bit to what we're reading here. I find it helpful just seeing how it fits into the giant historical picture, right, of world history. So here we are with King Nebuchadnezzar, and, and he's famous for the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It's worth noting Right? And then in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has, has these interactions with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? They're, they're exiles from Jerusalem. And we see King Nebuchadnezzar having a powerful encounter with the God of Israel in Daniel chapter 2. And, 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 and Daniel interprets a dream miraculously for the king. The king is moved. He's, he's blown away that the God of Daniel, dot, 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 X, Y, Z, he's amazed right, by Daniel's God. And we see Daniel and his, uh, his fellow mates, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, they're promoted. They're given positions of power and positions of influence. And this is kind of the narrative that we find ourselves in. This is the, the backdrop for Daniel chapter 3. Now it's nine years later. And I find it fascinating that King Nebuchadnezzar, who's had interactions now with not just uh, men who follow God, but he literally has been in proximity to the miracle provision of God. God used Daniel in a miraculous way to interpret a dream that he should have had no idea, no business knowing, all, you know, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the king, while amazed by this God, is still unchanged. And we find ourselves in Daniel 3 with a king who's building an idol that's gigantic, made of gold. And in just a few moments, is going to command everyone to fall down and worship it. I find this parallel so striking because many of us find ourselves in situations where we're around the things of God, but we also find ourselves unchanged. Uh, We'd rather many times be charmed with God than changed by God. And so... You, you know, you, 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 here's what I mean. I'm preaching from the Bible Belt of the United States, wherever you're watching this from. And many times people can get a little Bible in them. Maybe they've learned a Bible verse and they're like, oh, that's good. I like that, right? And they pull from it or they get the little plaque in the house that has a Bible verse on it and they put it in a nice little, you know, furniture-ish, you know, cosmetic way that looks nice and makes the home, pulls the home decor together, right? You, you get a worship song and you're feeling it and you like the beat and, you know, it's a good jam session for you. And, and we get around these things, right? We may go to a few church services. We may even go to a lot of church services. But the reality is we're more impressed with God, the things of God, but, but we're not that interested in being changed by God. In other words, we're charmed with him, but we're not changed by him. We enjoy his presence, but we don't want it to really alter us and change us or make us new or in any way mess up the life that we're currently living. We would prefer to be charmed with God than changed by God. And that is King Nebuchadnezzar's, that's his MO right now. He's unchanged, even though he's encountered the living God. He's not seeking He's not pursuing. He's not curious. Right? He's not in, you know, he's not in some Bible study with Daniel. <laughs> That's not happening, right? He's forgotten all about this. And consequently, he is now building an idol, a statue in the plains of Dura. 
and calling everyone to worship. I love what Dr. Lentz of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary writes as it pertains to the building and creation of idols. Humans have persuaded themselves into thinking that other created things will satisfy their deepest longings. The apparent wisdom in this is the illusion that created things can be more easily controlled than the creator. The illusion, Dr. writes, is that created things can be controlled, right? That, that you can control this. This is safe, but a God that can't be controlled is unsafe, right? And so we, we feel drawn to these things thinking that they will give us, right, the, the longing and satisfaction of our heart. But because it's something that we control and it's something that we build and we construct and we make, well, the temporary illusory peace or, 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 or satisfaction that you might have is always temporary, it's never fully and truly satisfying. And this is where we find ourselves on the plain of Dura with a king who has experienced God yet is unchanged by him and drawn to begin building a 60 cubit high statue of gold calling people to now worship that rather than the God that he saw move in miraculous and powerful ways. Idolatry is the issue at hand. And it is the illusion of control. And if you are a Westerner watching this right now, Westerners in particular, culturally speaking, we love independence and we love to think that we are in control. And the deception many times is that in our pursuit of being in control, yes, I'm speaking to you control freaks today, myself included, is that if you are not careful in your soul, your pursuit of control is actually a pursuit of building an idol that you can manage. And think, of what, think of what an idol is. It's something that you make, right? You shape it. You paint it. You make it look a certain way. You put it where you're going to put it, right? You, you set it up on the shelf. You put it in the front of the house. You, you put it on the plane of Dura. You shape it, make it, build it, paint it. You, you're in complete control, except you're not. That's the illusion. You were never in control in the first place. Verse 4 of Daniel chapter 3, this is how the story proceeds. The herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language. Imagine the declaration. The horns are blasting, right? The, the trumpets are blaring. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever doesn't fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Mm. How about that? Anybody who doesn't comply, you're going to get burned up. You're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. And so what happens? Well, the people, the exiles, the people of Babylon, they yield and they worship this idol. They bow down and they pledge fealty to King Nebuchadnezzar in this moment. And they begin to, to worship this idol this giant gold statue. And whether, you know, maybe, maybe, the, 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 maybe, maybe the statue is so magnificent and because it's just that amazing, people begin to fall down and worship. Like it's just that breathtaking. Doubtful, but maybe it is. Or maybe the pressure of seeing so many people, your peers, your friends, you know, other families, they're all doing this. So, you know what, like just the, the, the movement, the moment, you're swept up in it, so you just comply, right? 
I guess everyone else is, so why not? This is just, this is just the current, right? This is just the direction that everything is going. Or maybe the fear of being thrown into the furnace is so great. Maybe those are one of the three reasons that you choose, you know, in this moment to bow down and worship this statue. Regardless of the why, this is what is happening. And you need to understand as you're watching this today, there are things in our culture, right? Where those three things are still calling to the hearts of men and women. And even though we don't have statues for the most part that we're bowing down and worshiping, there are things that stand in direct contrast to the living God. Things that stand in the way of your heart, your devotion, and your obedience to him. And either it's because the consequence of not bowing down feels so great or because the pressure of everyone else going this direction is that or it just looks that good. Whatever it might be, many times we find ourselves bowing down to a cultural idol and giving our heart and affection and devotion to it. And you need to know, even though we don't use this language very much, anything that stands in the place of devotion or obedience to God is an idol. And here's my question for you. What idol do you have? What's standing in the way of your obedience to God today? Your devotion to him. Let me throw out a couple contexts here because, you know, I... I it's helpful for us just to see how this plays out in 2022. We just wrapped up baseball. I, I'm a big baseball fan. Love it. Um, a big Cardinal fan. Go St. Louis. Um, <laughs> well, we had Little League, you know, for my youngest child. I have four kids. And uh, in Kennesaw, our area of Atlanta, uh, there are signs on the baseball field fence. Not like out in not not like out in the outfield. No, no, the fence where the parents are sitting that says, Dear parents, your child does not play for the Atlanta Braves. All over the fence, right? As it says this, right? Reminding parents that this isn't as big a deal as you imagine it to be. And yet every season. We got parents that are fighting, right? You got, you have umpires. This just happened, right? Where an umpire had to, you know, look at a family and say, look, I'm about to throw you out of this joint, right? You're about to get tossed from a six-year-old baseball game, all right? Do we, can we understand how insane this is? And yet we've got signs that say your kids, they don't play for the Braves. This isn't their job, Right? They're not making money here. There's nothing literally on the line. And yet you are so invested in this. And this, one of the idols of American culture, is sports. Now, we can talk and list all kinds of different things, right? But, but understand the pull that sports have upon us as a people. It's an amazing thing. I have a friend who, who the doctors literally told him that he was not supposed to watch hockey anymore. Not joking. Because he was getting so amped up that he was getting bloody noses as he watched because his blood pressure was rising so high. Right? We know this with if you have a child that's in sports or you're in sports and it's pulling you away from the things of God. Right, and your 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 money goes towards sports, and your time goes towards sports, and your thoughts are going towards sports. Even just the other day, right? I'm watching the Cardinals, and I find myself so tense, and I, I'm not even identifying it in this moment, right? But all of a sudden, you know, the game's over. I'm mad because they're t playing terrible. My team is playing terrible, right? And I turn the TV off and now I'm grouchy, right? And I'm just kind of walking around the kitchen and Amy's like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. And then I realize I'm cranky because my team lost a game. How pitiful is that? And yet what we see 
is that many times in our culture, we've allowed sports or, or pick a different thing, that thing that has become a, a it, it can be a godly passion, a good thing, but it, be, it, it takes the place of God in your heart. The great deceiver comes and shifts this for you. And now what's supposed to be fun and just enjoyable and something that gives joy and is life-giving now becomes an idol in your heart and it gets your money, it gets your time, it gets your thoughts. And what does Jesus say about those who are to worship God is that you're supposed to give him your heart, your mind, and your actions. And yet we're giving it to other things. What does that mean? It means that we have something else that has taken the place of God. That's idolatry, and it's subtle. It doesn't look like a giant statue, right, that you would bow down to. Oh, no, no, this one's sneaky. It's passive. It's subtle. You don't even notice it. You, you have uh, wealth as another idol. This is an easy one for us to recognize. But many times we don't do anything about it. We live in, in the world of the American dream. But I have news for you. The American dream doesn't inherently mean godly dream. Okay? The pursue wealth, the love of money, right? There's danger in it. And when your wealth goes towards building your own kingdom time and time and time again. Right when the pursuit and your imagination, it just always lives in the in the in the you know in the future of oh when I finally have this and I'm just continuing to pursue that job and I'm pursuing that paycheck and when I finally get that paycheck, it goes straight into my little kingdom and straight into my this and straight into my that and 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 here we are right building time and time again our kingdom after our kingdom after our kingdom and we don't recognize the fact that we're pursuing wealth and gain far more than we are God's presence. When that's the case, there's an idol in your heart, whether you recognize it or not. This thing has taken over. Amy and I, you know, we got hit with a couple things that just debts that we weren't planning on. You know, our kids all... We're getting braces at the same time and had some things happen in the basement in our house and just all of a sudden everything just kind of crashed, right? And and so my background is in finance and so I'm just, every thought that I have, right, is money related and getting out of this hole and we're going to pay this and that and bam, 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 bam and, and debt snowballs and books and, and I, can't, I I know myself. Business ideas and kids, you run that lemonade stand, you know, and you're going <laughs> to. All right, that might be extreme, kind of. But all of a sudden, it can become all consuming. Your pursuit of wealth and getting ahead. And if it's taking you out of giving to your church, if all these other things take priority over God and his kingdom, I have news for you. Whether you want to call it this or not, there is an idol at work in your heart. Now, I'm just, I'm just hitting, I'm spitballing on these, okay? But the third one, and probably maybe the most even significant for us is politics right now. And this isn't going away. Where it's easy, it, while our politicians are not statues of gold, we treat them like that, do we not? As if these men or women have the ability to sway, right, our eternity. This is how we act. And when our candidate isn't getting elected or things aren't moving the direction that we want, we act as though the world is literally falling apart. And we frame people and vilify people and we act as if Jesus is attached to a party. And I have news for you. There is no such thing as Jesus conservatism, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Republican, Jesus uh, Democrat. There's no such thing as Jesus liberalism that does not exist because Jesus has not hitched his wagon to your political party. That has not happened. 
And when you act as though he has, what you do is you create a pedestal and you begin to put people on it. And before you know it, you've built a statue in the plain of Dura and you're beginning to worship that statue as if this thing has the ability to control what's happening on the inside of your heart. And they don't. They do not. And it is idolatry to treat it anything differently. There is only one who occupies that position, and it's God Almighty. He is the one who has true control. Are all of, do all of these things have a measure of importance? Sure. Money, of course. Politics, yeah. Even sports, while its significance is smaller than the other two, it's still an enjoyment. It's still a gift from God. And yet they become distorted and they become idols so what happened in daniel chapter 3 verse 13 our men shadrach meshach and abednego they refuse to give in to what's happening culturally speaking they choose the way of bravery rather than falling in step with what everybody else is doing with what has been commanded of them. And this is what happens in Daniel chapter 3. And this is one of the reasons and one of the ways you know an idol is at work. Verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. They wouldn't comply. And the reaction is that of blind anger and rage. And this is what happens, right? When you're, when you're, who moved my cheese, right? It's the, it's the, it's the thing that you found sacred that has now been moved. And out of insecurity, we react with anger. We hulk out because we've lost our illusionary sense of control. Verse 16 we see the response of these men. And I got to tell you, it's amazing. These men are amazing in this moment. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. They're not being disrespectful. They're not rude, but they're, they've drawn a line in the sand and they've made it clear. This is what we will not cross. It doesn't matter that this is what everybody is doing. It doesn't matter that the consequence is literally going to be our life. It doesn't matter, dot, dot, dot. This is not my God. This is not how my God chooses or has informed me to worship him. And I will not cross this line. Not happening. (laughs) I mean, come on. The boldness, right? The strength, the conviction, the bravery. And while the idols that we have presented to us, either culturally speaking or of our own construction, they look different. It requires the same spirit of bravery to resist it and reject just being somebody who's charmed with God rather than being changed by God. Because someone who's been changed by him begins to live different. There are things that are produced in your heart that change who you are and how you live. And so when we look at the text, there's three things that I'm going to hit and I'm going to hit fast for you today. Three things for us on how to live bravely. Three things that we see from the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Number one is that these men accepted the reality that following God looks different. God says to be holy as I am holy. And that means you're going to be set apart. Jesus said, hey, if you follow me, anybody who comes after me, you're going to be persecuted. In other words, how would someone be persecuted unless their life actually looks different enough for people to notice? 
There is a difference in those who have called themselves followers of God and people who are choosing to follow him. Your life should look different. Your mouth should sound different. Your actions, your marriage, your parenting. Not in every single thing, but in many, in most. The call to God upon your life is going to have you looking different. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. And many times it, it, it's, not a, it, it's not enjoyable to be different all the time. Yet God has called us to it. Accept your reality that following God is going to have you looking different. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing while everybody else was bowing down. Number two, building a life, a, a, a life of consistent relationship with God. This is how we live bravely for him. We don't know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we don't know what their devotional life looked like, their, their, their mornings, afternoons, evenings, but what we see is that they serve God. In fact, they said, you know, it, it, the God that we serve is able to deliver us. There's something there where they have relationship with him. They've been, they've been doing this with him. Right, Whether it's praying, whether it's reading the scrolls, whether it's confessing the Old Testament, whether it's just simple obedience, practicing God's commands and his ordinances, they have relationship with him. And many times it's the little things right, that are building up over time that give us the strength to endure, that help us have bravery in the moments of trial and persecution, the big moments. You're not just going to suddenly have strength in the moment of truth. It's the, it's the little moments leading up. When you don't want to go to church, getting in your car and going anyway. When you don't want to get up and read your Bible, but getting up and reading anyway. Right? When you don't want to bring that notebook, nobody else has a notebook, but I'm going to take notes at church, taking notes at church and looking back over those things. Beginning to guard your mouth, all the things, the shaping that you're doing with, with your family, with your, with your home, and, 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 and literally allowing the Holy Spirit into your life and making you new into somebody different. It's the little things. Obedience matters. A life of simple obedience matters. And many times you don't see it in the moment until you're in the moment. And you have strength that you didn't know you had. Number three, choose obedience even if you don't understand. Says so understanding can wait, but obedience cannot. That's hard to hear sometimes, isn't it? Understanding can wait, but obedience can't. Obedience is the name of the game. We know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know if God was going to show up in this way, but they chose to believe. They chose to obey anyway. And this is the heart of faith. God, I don't know fully how this is going to turn out. I don't know how, how or when or if you're going to show up the way I want you to, but it's not going to change my faithfulness and obedience to you. I am choosing to obey you no matter what. This is my line in the sand and I'm not crossing it. We choose obedience even when we don't understand. And for time's sake, you can, you can read how the story ends in verse 26 and 27 as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in fact delivered, right? The, the king comes to the furnace. This furnace is so hot, by the way, that guards die literally just trying to get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. That's how hot it is. It's not like they put him in there and the thing went out, right? no. God showed up miraculously and he delivers them in the same way he delivers you. Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fiery furnace and the, the Bible tells us that there was a fourth in the fire like an angel. Foreshadowing of the deliverance of Christ when things are heating up in your own life and things are difficult and you're in your own trials and in your own persecution and your own difficulty. Who is it that shows up for you as well? It's God Almighty. It's his son, Jesus Christ. That's the God that we serve. And that's who gives you the strength and courage and bravery to live for him. We serve an amazing God, and he's called you to live 
a brave life on his behalf. Let's do that today. Father, I thank you in this moment for who you are. I thank you that you've called us to live for you, God, and it's going to require being brave and being courageous at many times. And Lord, those that are watching, uh, God, I pray right now that you would give them courage, right? Where, wherever they're, whether they're watching on a phone, Lord, whether they're watching from their couch, from their living room, God, I pray that you would give bravery right now by the power of your spirit. If you're, if you're watching this today, and you have never put your faith in Jesus, in this God that we serve, then today I'm calling you to lay down everything else that stands between you and devotion and obedience to God and to put your faith in Jesus Christ. This is a moment for you to say, Jesus, I choose you. You are the son of the living God and I put my faith in you. Help Save me. Make me new. I leave this life of sin, all that I know that is not of you, and I choose to follow you. Tell them that. Do that. And if you're sitting here and you're watching today and you have put your faith in Jesus, but you've fallen away, this is a moment for you to say, Lord Jesus, thank you. That you have not left me, but you're drawing me into deep relationship with you. These things that have crept back up, these things that have gotten in the way, today I leave them behind. I reject the charmed life and I accept the changed life. Make me new today, God, afresh. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Here's what I want to invite you to do. You can comment in the chat. You can send a Facebook message to the church. We want to help you get connected. We want to help you take your next steps here. Uh, and with that, I want to say uh, praise God. Thankful for the series that we're in. And we'll see you right here next week. Good morning and welcome. Uh, wow. Sometimes stuff gets stuck in your throat. That might be one of those moments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Every Wednesday in June, our High Point kids said it totally wrong. It's called. <laughs> it's what not is every it? Wednesday. Uh, in June, four Wednesdays in June. Yeah, four Wednesdays. We're skipping one. Okay, four Wednesdays in June. And what is it called again? Summer nights. Summer nights. That wasn't what it was called. Okay, so. All right. I'm not so beginning. You're doing that announcement. Okay, that's fine. Oh God. All right. <laughs> I don't. I have to stretch a little bit. I have to stretch a little bit. Okay. All right. So you're going to, okay, I got we're one just going to switch. Okay. All right, here we go. One more time.